Good afternoon. Welcome to this edition of Finweek Money Matters, the show that helps you manage your finances. I'm Samantha Loring and my guest host is, of course, Mark Ashton. On the show today, we're looking at some succession planning and a more focused look at African Bank at, uh, uh, with African Bank CEO Leon Kirkenis. Uh, and we'll get his thoughts on the job of uh, d uh, the job he's been doing for the better part of two decades. We'll talk to him about, of course, the fact that he's got skin in the game. So he's also felt the wrath of the share price uh, coming under pressure. We'll talk to him about the future of unsecured lending in South Africa. And then, of course, uh, taking a look later on in the show, we'll also take a look at what it means to become successful uh, in South Africa at C-suite level and whether you need African experience for that and finally we'll get some ideas on Liberty's Evolve Investment Suite and whether it is the uh, whether it offers investors opportunities to make more money given you don't have to pay an upfront fee. If you have any comments for us or any feedback you can send them through to Money Matters at abn360.com. Leon Kirkinas, uh, CEO of African Bank Investments, has, be, has been doing the job for uh, longer than younger staff members have been alive. In fact, two decades is a long time to stay in one job. But despite this and the fact that African Bank has uh, faced some serious crises recently, Leon Kirkinas has no intention, he says, of stepping down. We get some insights into the man now with uh, Tandi Sizwe Maklochana from Finweek, Sasha Narishkin from Vestact, and uh, as I mentioned, uh, Mark Ashton, Finweek uh, editor, with me all at the desk. We're also joined on the line by the man himself, uh, Able CEO Leon Kirkinas. Leon, sorry, I'm messing up your surname there, so I'm going to throw <laughs> straight to you and uh, let you do more of the talking for us because, yeah. as I mentioned, you know, you you have, of course, had skin in the game. You own about 2% of uh, Able shares right now. You certainly know what uh, the market has been saying around um, the outlook of unsecured lending, the concern around the quality of your book. Are things getting better when it comes to collections because you have changed the way you incentivize staff? Yeah, good afternoon to everyone and to all the to everyone out there. Uh, you make me f feel so old saying I've been <laughs> there for 20 years, two decades, uh, etc., etc. I feel very young, I've got to tell you. Um, but what are the benefits of, of actually being uh, in being in a, in, a, in a business and in an industry over a long period of time, you see lots of cycles come and go. And industries always, no matter what cycle you're in, have their ups and their downs. And so, you know, in your introduction, you spoke about a crisis. I mean, the, I'd certainly like to put the so-called crisis into, into perspective. So we had an increase in our bad debts during the, the course of this year. We did identify that we would be seeing... Uh, more bad debts during the course of this year because of the supply side that was building up. And it's no surprise, whenever supply builds up in the in a marketplace, you are going to have more risk. So despite the fact that we had a higher bad debt, we still generated a billion rand off the tax for the six months and a 25% return on tangible equity. So I wouldn't call that a crisis. I would call that uh, a uh, a performance that we could have done and should have done better on because it doesn't translate from that into a crisis. Just as to your second question, the uh, or to the question around uh, has our collection started to improve? Yes, it has. So it's not only in terms of changing the incentive structures, but it's also because uh, of the amount of extra effort and energy that's been put into um, uh, focus on on the on the collection. So we're definitely seeing an improvement. Yeah, Leon, I've got two questions for you. One is um, one is around just the role of a banker. I mean, you know, the, the bankers, mainstream bankers have taken quite a lot of credibility hits in the last couple of years. So I guess my first question to you would be whether or not you would still enjoy being considered a banker. And I guess secondly, the, the role of microlending in South Africa going forward, there's obviously a niche there. There's something you find very, very profitable. It's a good business. What do you th see the role of, of an organization such as yours in terms of getting funding? A and, and do you think you're going to be able to shuck off a lot of the, the, the credibility issues around the, the broader microlending sector in the next couple of years? Yeah, very good questions and actually very interrelated. Um, so the first thing is that, you know, most people look at business and, 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 and sadly business themselves look at business often from a profit perspective. And really, for, from my perspective, the first thing you've got to do is you've got to say, does the business serve the needs of society in the first place? And only if it does, and does it do it in a sustainable way? And only if it then does 
do that, are you entitled to actually generate a return? And on top of that, will you get the support of the funders who feel that you're getting the right sort of balance between what's good for society and then what's good for uh, the return profile that they look for? And there's no question that um, uh, the, the, the role that, that uh, of late unsecured lending has just gotten this really bad rap. Uh, some of it deservedly, but mostly undeservedly, because really it's provided millions of people with the, the ability to actually look after their housing, education, and uh, other needs, because they don't have collateral to provide security on the, to, uh, to traditional banks. Um, as far as taking the ensuring that the industry remains uh, or, or becomes um, uh, has a better image over time, our role clearly as the market leader is it is our responsibility to ensure that the, that the business that the industry deals with a lot of the perceptions and the, some of the realities that, that that have to be dealt with and um, and they need to be dealt with decisively so i 'm convinced that whilst in the last sort of you know, a uh, year or so, it's been really kind of pretty negative uh, publicity. Uh, in the long run, always, um, the right things come out and, and more balance, uh, a more balanced perspective emerges, always. Dion, you spoke about sustainability, and I think that one of the things you've had f fantastic funding lines for the last couple of years. I mean, we, we saw bond issuance this week, mm -hmm. and it looked like quite an expensive um, issuance relative to what you guys have done in the past. Do you think it's a more normal funding channel level of funding for, for for the bank going forward you know it, again very good question i think that uh perceptions feed uh, a view of risk and therefore when there is a, a heightened perception of risk you are going to pay more uh than you would in a, in in more uh calmer environment so we did issue the seven-year instrument uh, the, the actual extra cost was about 50 basis points to 75 basis points more than what we would have paid uh, previously. And, as, as, you know, and that will kind of normalize when the environment normalizes. So I think over time uh, you'll see the, the spreads come back down. Uh, it's just the nature of markets and cyclical markets. Um, Leon, any lessons that you've learned uh, from the current um, market environment? Yeah, great question, a really good question. Two, two lessons for me personally. The one is, uh, is that uh, communicate, 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 and communicate uh, all the time when things are, as things unfold so that people don't feel um, uh, like there's surprise that's coming. Um, that's very important. And secondly, I think, again, uh, one lesson that comes out of this always and has, has, is always something to, re to, to take to heart is whatever you're going to do, be decisive and don't sort of mess around. What, did you, what were you not decisive on then? No, I think that, uh, take for example, the, um, uh, you know, we saw the growth in unsecured lending and um, we saw that playing out. We called it, the, we were the first guys to call it. To call it. And, you know, we, we could have probably reduced our loan sizes a couple of months earlier than we did. Um, that's an example of that, and in particular in the Ellerine's financial services environment. Um, but, you know what, uh, it's not something you can do about the past. It's you learn the lessons, which is why it's such a good question. And, and going forward, you, you change outcomes into the future. Stay with us, Leon, if you don't mind. I just want to ask uh, Sasha in terms of get, get your perspective from a shareholder who has been quite committed to Abel's story from a longer-term perspective, obviously. Um, what do you think of, firstly, what Leon is saying right now? Does it instill confidence? And how do you feel about the share right now? Uh, we've never had a problem with management. We mm -hmm. class them as one of the best. I mean, typically we steer away from all banks because there's a lot of black box activity that takes part in the background that you don't know about. You know, remember even a well-run bank like First Rand, they wrote off a large amount and wouldn't take questions on it specifically because they're sensitive issues. Now, you know, I think in part the market had um, issues with this because up to that point they would felt quite comfortable. Um, I, but the, the one thing I want to add to the funding specifically, you know, you, you indicated they raised money at higher rates, but everyone has globally. So since that uh, Ben Bernanke speech towards the end of May, 
everyone's had to raise money at higher rates simply because rates worldwide have ticked up. So I want to know how much of that is actually mm -hmm. market conditions, all else being equal. So don't stress too much and view this more as an opportunity over a longer date. I know that they're going to be prudent because they've survived a crisis before. And last thing I want to add, Jamie Dimon's daughter, and he happens to be of Greek extract too and a banker, when his daughter asked him in the last financial crisis, Dad, what is a financial crisis? He said, oh, I don't know, every six to seven years. <laughs> there you go, Leon. Yeah. You certainly do appreciate that one. But Sasha, before we uh, say goodbye to Leon, any questions that you'd like to ask management? Well, I, think, I think they've done a pretty good job on balance um, kind of post this crisis. And I think the funding model is probably more important to the equity holders long run and they seem to have that under control what is the difference in the nature of the people who own uh, your funding uh, rather than the hedge funds and the short term is what sort of commitments do you have from those people and how often do you speak to them the the treasury specifically yeah it's very it's a very good question um you know the, the one thing that uh, one of the big benefits we have in south africa is that there's a smaller number of people um, that are uh, that, that make up the the capital markets and the debt funders in particular, and like everything in life, and it's true in in your personal life as much as it's true in in business, is you've got to build solid relationships that are trusted, and you know we've we've been very lucky and fortunate and privileged to be able to have a a high level of communication and engagement with our funders. And there's high levels of trust, and and you know it's it's something that we will never take a, advantage of, and are privileged to actually be in a position to have uh, that sort of those sorts of relationships. So, you know, communication, as I said earlier, is vital, and if it comes from a place where people view it that it's credible, then you're fine, always. Leon, sorry, it seems like we've got so many questions actually to ask you, so hopefully you can stay a few more minutes with us. I've just got to find out, uh, you know, in terms of diversification, you continue to say that uh, transactional banking becoming a fully fledged bank like the Standard Banks or First Rand is certainly not something you aim to do. Uh, Africa's not on the cards right now. Mm. We know Ellerines is something that uh, uh, you, you bought. Uh, perhaps, uh, you know, the question is not whether it was the right uh, decision or not. The question is what you're going to do with it going forward because it is a drag on uh, it is a drag on earnings there are some views that it might in fact post a loss this year so what is going to drive growth into the future give us an idea of where your thinking is when it comes to where african bank is going to be in five years time um and, and i suppose what is going to define the bank uh, for the next 10 years a very good question and i think again and what typically happens when you're in a cycle like this, everyone then starts to talk about market saturation, that customers have too much debt and they don't have any capacity to, to borrow and the market is, is, um, is, is like basically sut. The, the reality is that I think it, it's quite telling that we're not wanting to go into transactional banking, that we're not wanting to go outside of the borders of South Africa because we see significant opportunities for growth in this environment. Uh, there's a time to grow rapidly and there's also a time to grow far slower given the way cycles play out. So five years from now, uh, you know, I'll give you a simple statistic. Only 20% of the housing stock in South Africa is capable of being mortgaged. Um, and yet, where do the majority of people live and how do they fund their, 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 their housing, et cetera, et cetera. So the needs are, are immense and significant. And the growth, we're still a relatively young uh, country in terms of uh, the age of the population. Um, so we see ample opportunities for growth into the future in what we do, which is the, you know, the, the provision of, of credit to people so they can improve their lives. And I'm afraid it doesn't get much more um, sexy than that, but it is a very real calling that we have uh, in our business. The, the question that then, just follow up from that, is is there a risk of you not being diversified enough, as evident by your, uh, you know, kind of uh, very, very large exposure to the lower uh, LSM groups in South Africa? You know, we diversified significantly across the entire industries in the country. We have three million customers who really work in, in big uh, in, in civil service in they work in the banks they work in uh industry they work in small mom and pop shops so we are really very very well diversified across across the uh, economic landscape of this country 
Leona, one of the questions that, uh, that we get asked quite often is around succession planning for the bankers. Um, you know, there tend to be some quite high profile people that have been in their positions for quite an extended period of time. Yeah. First Strand's a good example of a bank that's managed succession planning particularly well. Uh, you know, what, fr from a shareholder perspective, how are you going to manage that process? I mean, in a lot of ways, you are the, the, the face of African Bank. Um, what, what sort of reassurance or what sort of thoughts are you, uh, have you got in place going forward? No, it's a very good point and a very valid point. You can never build a business, a sustainable business into the future if it is perceived or actually is reliant on one person. That, that's just you're creating a very weak business. So one of the roles that uh, any chief executive have, and obviously given that I've been uh, doing this for some time, is to make sure that there's depth in talent and succession planning is uh, is is not only there but visible to the market so more and more you will see more and more of the um of the of the depth of talent that we've built into the business i can reassure shareholders that we have a deep pool of talent uh, it just will become more vis visible in the course of the next uh, over the over the, ne f uh, the next few uh, months and years ahead so we expect some communication for potentially on that leon no, don't read that, that, that. I'm certainly moving. No, <laughs> no, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Yes, yeah, so, so you will see. You, as shareholders engage with with the, with the business, they'll see more and more of the people who really make up and, and run the business, and 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 gain a high degree of comfort from from the guys who are here. Appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us today, uh, African Bank CEO Leon Kirkinas. So just a quick conversation at the desk here. Um, what are your thoughts right now on Able versus the other banks? Because uh, you've got money, you're thinking, where should, where should I invest it right now? Why would you invest in Able relative to the other options out there, not just the banks? Sure. Look, I mean, I'm talking my own book here because I did buy the shares. I think they were 15 or 20 or whatever where I bought. So I, I believe in the story. I think that I, I believe the funding I issue, and I mean, we throw it to Sasha again. I, do think it is expensive funding for the next seven years. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I think that margins are going to be very, very tight, but maybe it is just the new normal for lenders. I mean, I don't know, maybe I'll throw the question to you. Is this going to be the new normal for, for lenders? We've had fantastic cheap credit for a lot of time. These guys have got deep funding lines, I think, and I think that is the one differentiator that African Bank has over a lot of the smaller players is they have genuinely deep pockets. They can make, the, you know, there's enough fat in there without chasing the yield on it. It's interesting you make that point because remember that a lot of people who've been extending credit aggressively have been the bigger banks. Mm -hmm. You know, you would have noticed that the Standard Bank's numbers from uh, the period to end December, sometime in March, everyone should have been spooked then because on a 40 billion rand unsecured book, didn't they write off a billion? Yet, you know, nobody even blinks because. Typically, there are lots of other moving parts. Um, but to that's the, the value bank. of being a diversified bank. Yes and no, because what sort of quality of business are you writing if it's not your core business? You know, I mean, this is African Bank's one and only business. Now, people say, well, Capitec obviously have the retail deposits, but remember that the majority of their business is doing exactly what African Bank are doing. Now, people have for a long time now said, oh, well, Capitec being more conservative, they write better business, etc. They've got better systems, they're newer, etc., etc. Now, suddenly, when we were looking, I don't know, around March, April at single digit growth, suddenly we're looking at flat. So obviously the environment for them too has changed quite dramatically and quickly. In African banks case, remember that a whole bunch of offshore hedges decided that this was a juicy short. And because there are not lots of um, shareholders who were standing in the way, in recent months we've seen Coronation, the PIC say, okay, we're standing in the way and we're happy to buy at these specific mm -hmm. levels. Um, you know, at the end of the day, they're taking their chances, the shorts, just as much as, as the longs. And if that unwinds quite quickly, gee, then, you know, your purchase at rock bottom price, what did you say? 1520. See you, clever. And Leon Kirkin has said, we're also clever. Yeah. So does that mean we have to listen to you on your sell today on the trade of the week? Well, I think so. Because <laughs> you're seeming to right? <laughs> um, We're going to have to leave it there for today. Thank you so much for joining us, Sasha. Sasha Narishkin from Vestact. Remember that you can read more about these stories and many others in this week's edition of Fin Week on shelves from today. The magazine also available digitally in English and Afrikaans. That via mysubs.co.za. Time now for our Fin Week trade of the week.
Well, today's trade of the week is a sell on Steinoff. You don't have much confidence there on the value unlock when they list their European retail a assets then? Okay, I mean, I think take that in context. I mean, a couple of months back, I did say buy it. It was 23 Rand 50. It now hit 27 Rand, or just under 27 Rand today. So, I mean, you, you have had a nice run up. And at the time, we actually said use a bit of gearing because you'll be able to use like a CFD. And, and, mm -hmm. and you've, you've made the, you know, you've had a nice, I think, 12 or 13% in, in the last six weeks, which is not bad return. Um, and, and if you added a bit of gearing in there, you've done really well for yourself. I think that, you know, yesterday we saw Detroit go bust, mm -hmm. effectively. Mm -hmm. um, what has Detroit and Steinoff got in common, uh, though? I think it, it, it <laughs> reminds us that there's actually big issues still in the market yeah. that I think that we haven't totally factored in. Europe's still very slow in terms of growth. Even China, Chinese growth is slowing down quite drastically. Um, I think maybe it is, you know, we saw Dow and S&P hit records yesterday. It's time to maybe take a little bit off the table. And if you've made some money, here's the time to maybe sell down. Okay, so it's basically just a function of the stocks kind of, as you say, around 13%. Uh, and uh, perhaps somewhere else you can put your money right now. Perfect. But and sign hindsight, off. And hindsight is a perfect science because I'm able to show that. There exactly. We go, there we go. Money. Some evidence there of yet another uh, good trading decision. But forward PE sitting at 8.5 right now. It hasn't really changed. Mm. much between seven and eight it's gone up slightly um, they are still making acquisitions in Europe this is an opportune time to really buy assets at perhaps depressed prices they're also buying into the property assets there Europe is ultimately going to come out of this crisis says who we hope we hope because okay. we're no, tired uh, of talking okay. about the eurozone crisis Fair enough. I hear your but point. no but Europe ultimately will recover at some point in time mm -hmm. surely and at that point in time if you're a long-term investor why does it make sense to sell at just below 27 rand sure look by all means there's a good story there it appears single digit cheap um, they've got a lot of debt that they still need to sort out. Um, you know, we, we will only know if they buy assets at a, at a reasonable price when they actually sell them. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that the, the point that we made from this trade was we set a price, we said this is where we think we'll make some money. It, it maybe is time to, and if it pulls back, and I've said again, if it pulls back to 23 bucks a share, then buy it again and repeat it. Um, but for the moment, it just looks like you've got some profit, rather take some profit off the table. A trading idea for you there for today. Idea. Thanks to Mark Ashton. He, of course, is the FinWeek editor. We've still got Tony Cesar and Maklachana, deputy editor with us at the desk. It's time now to pay the bills. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome back. Well, in the past, it was an MBA or good management experience that were considered prerequisites for anyone aiming on becoming a C-suite executive. Nowadays, one could argue that uh, to really excel at the top experience working outside of South Africa and on the rest of the African continent is imperative in order to be considered for executive positions within larger corporates here in South Africa. This week's management section takes a look at this growing trend. Tandy sees we're, of course, still with us. And we're also joined by Jessica Hubbard uh, from Finweek as well. We've got Carlos uh, da Costa, Business Development Manager at Africa and Emerging Markets, and JJ Van Dongen, Senior Vice President at Philips Africa, joining us to give us their perspective on this issue. Thank you so much for joining us today. Uh, JJ, I'll start off with you uh, because you have the education experience when it mm. comes to the MBA. In fact, you've got the background as a nuclear scientist uh, and going into to Philips. Um, but, but what is your experience in terms of um, how much on the ground African experience has meant to your being able to fulfill your role at, uh, at Philips? Uh, I think most global multinationals are looking for well-rounded people. So, it, and, and what we see is many people in their career paths will actually either have the academics, but then will go into research or go into uh, uh, marketing, sales, or be involved in distribution. And what we see now is, well, as, as the global companies are seeing more and more interest in, say, in Africa or emerging markets, there's more and more need for people with an experience on the ground. Because it is challenging in Africa, and uh, with 54 countries, it's not one market. Every country is different and needs to understanding those needs of those individual countries. Mm -hmm. So I found with my background as well from the academic side, as well as being able to couple it with having experience on the ground, working with people in the ground in the different countries, makes a huge difference in terms of understanding. Um, you, you talk about that on the ground experience. Um, you know, 
we, we, we've heard and we hear of a lot of companies moving to Africa and some of the challenging things which of course poses barriers from the, for those companies in terms of expanding and yeah. getting into those markets. Some of those uh, are things like culture and understanding people mm -hmm. and how they live. I mean, what are some of the most important elements of that on the ground experience um, that would make it easy or say for, for someone you know, coming into a company yeah. that wants to, ex to, ex to expand to Africa? I think taking up our, our, our case study, uh, we, have had, we have a rapid accelerate plan across Africa. We're doubling the people we have on the ground in the space of two to three years. This year alone, we've recruited more than 80 managers mm -hmm. across Africa. All of those are local managers. Most of those are local managers. But what we do see is a necessi necessity for some infusion of the culture of the company and the talent that does exist as well to give them the opportunity to develop. So one, yes, very important. We believe very fundamentally in our approach that if we're working in West Africa, it should be West Africans running our business and, and understanding the business there. Same for East Africa, Egypt, etc. Uh, but we do see it as, as, as very useful having the senior management people having an experience in that market as well. So we do have, we have placed general managers and we are placing general managers in that, in the teams, so they learn, so they then come back and actually operate at a different level when they come back to the organization. Mm -hmm. mm. Carlos, give us the perspective, uh, of course, being involved in recruitment. Is there a mandate right now? Is Africa a big prerequisite when it comes to, to st uh, training up people, hiring people for executive positions, or just under that with the intention of them ultimately, of course, be, uh, filling those positions?